All right, uh, so hello, welcome back from lunch, everyone. Um, next session we're gonna be going through right now, we've got a set of three talks on dynamic load balancing. Uh, and the first one's from Dr. Rob van der Wingart from Intel uh, on using AMR proxy codes for dynamic load balancing. So I'll turn it over to him. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I apologize for not being able to be present uh, physically. Uh, travel is a bit of a uh, difficulty for me, but uh, hopefully I can uh, keep your attention uh, virtually uh, via the slides. Um, and um, I'll, I can announce that there will be bonus points for people who can guess um, the meaning of the various uh, components of this opening slide uh, at the end of this talk. Um, I'm in uh, Intel Labs, which is part of Intel Federal, which is an operation that um, does work uh, sponsored by uh, the, uh, the federal government. So, but it is Intel. And uh, it's, uh, the, the topic of today uh, is, uh, I hope, uh, of uh, great interest to you. It's about how to do dynamic load balancing and actually how to assess how well you're doing with dynamic bo uh, load balancing, which is going to be very important um, as we increase the scale of our systems. Okay, uh, show this to your lawyer. Uh, it's in the slides that uh, uh, Randall has and that uh, you can peruse later, and it is will just show some caveats about the results I'm going to show. All right, today, so I'll talk about um, background of a practical to parallel research kernel, um, and Maria Gartheron presented uh, that background more elaborately last year, uh, but I want to briefly recap where this whole work came from so you can understand the topic of today, which is uh, adaptive measure refinement. It's a new kernel that's part of the um, uh, parallel research kernel suite, and I want to explain why we are focusing on that thing now. Once uh, I've set that stage, I'll give you a, a specification of that kernel uh, we have specifications for all the re parallel research kernels. Uh, in this case, it's mostly pictorial, but there's a very elaborate, uh, precise specification in the document uh, about uh, the parallel research kernels. Then, briefly, I'll show you the uh, reference implementations that we created uh, of, these, uh, of this new kernel, and then the most important part, of course, the experimental results, running this thing uh, in a shared memory and distributed memory environment and draw some conclusions from that and outline future work. So the parallel research kernels is a, is a suite of problems um, and they, are, they have paper and pencil specifications. Uh, we do that so that you can implement them in various different ways. Um, and um, the idea is that these kernels cover a broad a range of patterns that occur in real applications. Not only that, they are often bottlenecks in real parallel applications. Um, so uh, we keep those kernels very simple. There are, there are similar suites, and I, I could expound on what sets the parallel research kernels apart. Uh, that will take too much time, and uh, maybe you can go over Maria's slides from last year. But I did want to highlight a few, uh, few uh, characteristic points of these kernels. So we keep them very easy and simple uh, so that you can easily point to, uh, port them to other languages, uh, other runtimes. That's non-trivial effort for even many applications, and you can only do so much of them. We've ported these things to quite a few different uh, environments, and I would invite you, and I apologize, the URL is not on it. I'll send it afterwards. I invite you to check out what we have today. Um, they're, they're especially simple so that they have meaning to different domain scientists. Uh, of course, you have your own uh, pet projects that, that do very well in the runtime of your choice. Then you try to explain what this means to, to and say it's, it's from molecular bio biology, and then you try to explain what this means to an economist, and they'll just scratch their head. So we want to keep them so simple that all you need is, um, is a high school diploma to understand what these things do. So you can interpret the results obtained with these kernels uh, uh, in the context of your own uh, domain of interest. Then they're all dominated by a single feature, and that is if you have multiple features and all our applications do, do various different things with the data that they, uh, that they process, they kind of mesh, uh, mesh uh, the various performance aspects together, and that's important for your own application, but it is difficult 
if that application that is in our suite doesn't look like your application. So we, we want to do we want to have a single feature that dominates performance of this kernel, and then you build up the signature of your own application in terms of those separate features. Um, we parameterize all the kernels, so they you can spec always specify trivial things like problem size, number of iterations, number of cores uh, to use, uh, but also in many cases, you can choose different algorithmic variations, uh, uh, the ones that you're, that you're most interested in. So these are not benchmarks. It's really a toolkit for exploration of parallel systems. Then we make sure that each kernel does actual work. That's, that might sound uh, ridiculous uh, in a, an environment where people actually are interested in the result of applications, but many benchmark suites or other similar toolkits uh, have operations in them that don't constitute actual work. You might want to know how fast is the barrier on my system and you execute 50 in a row. Well, how will you even know that you've done those 50 barriers? One is enough. Um, and uh, it, it often doesn't, and, and if there's no intervening work between those barriers, then oftentimes runtimes can take shortcuts that, and you would never know that happened. So we make sure that our kernel actually does real work and that enables us, uh, among others, to verify that we've done the work correctly. So no matter what parameters you specify, we will check the final result against known analytical solutions. And that's very convenient, especially when you are, I mean, it's not, the, not so much to catch cheaters, but it's more uh, to make it, to, uh, it's more a debugging tool. If you've ported these kernels to a new uh, environment, did you still do the right thing? So the verification test will help you there. And the last one is kind of implicit, but I, I highlighted it uh, because uh, it's an important one. We make sure that we have enough concurrency in this problem to keep all the resources on which we run this kernel uh, busy so the load can be balanced. Now, in the beginning, we were not interested in, in uh, exploring load imbalances, so we, we, so we made sure that this criterion was satisfied by making all our kernels pretty much trivially statically load balanced. So we not know, you divide your work at the beginning and all ranks or chars or um, uh, tasks, they all have a, the same amount of uh, work to do. Um, that is no longer going to cut it in the future. And in, to some extent, you could argue that it hasn't cut it for some time. But as system sizes grow and as our workloads become more mature, there will be more and more need for dynamic load balancing. So you might do in-situ in visualization of only part of your, of your uh, uh, problem domain, or you might suffer uh, system fluctuations because of uh, um, OS uh, uh, jitter, other, other reasons. So our nice, sweet, homogeneous uh, workload, at least homogeneous on paper, starts to experience difficulties because of local variations on the system. So we want to, so a number of projects have started to uh, investigate this. Some, of course, have been going on for a long time, as, as Charm++, uh, but there are new kids on the block like HPX and Legion and others. And we want to find out if it's, well, if it's worth doing this, uh, this work, um, uh, how well are you doing? So we want to design some kernels that, uh, that investigate this so they need to require dynamic load balancing at all system scales. Why is that important? Uh, many times, we don't have the largest systems uh, at our disposal to do testing. So we want to do a small-scale test to see if our methods for doing dynamic load balancing are actually working. And for that to happen, uh, and, and we want to careful control over, uh, over the amount of, well, potential load imbalance or sources of load imbalance, that means we need some algorithmic source. So the kernels, should do, the, the kernels to be designed should do that. They should allow us to control how much of a source of load imbalance is there, so the intensity of the sources of load imbalance, as well as how often does this happen. And then we want to do this. And the, uh, this, the last point, again, should be trivial for this audience, but it's not so trivial for a number of the groups who are working on, uh, on novel runtimes. It should be data dependencies that make load balancing non-trivial in all our scientific applications. We do time stepping, or we do some other, uh, we do relaxation, or other methods where we do a number of uh, synchronizations in the course of uh, solving our problems. And those synchronizations 
uh, mean if you don't arrive at the synchronization points at the same time? You've, you've incurred a load imbalance. So our real applications do that. Our kernels should reflect that too. Um, and then that's a, we recognize, of course, that as you in, try to improve your load balance, uh, many times it goes at the expense of communication. So there's a happy middle ground, or it could be an unhappy middle ground too, but happy middle ground where you balance the load as well as you can and minimize communication. So you uh, improve uh, uh, execution time. Once we're done, we want to test, we use these uh, uh, newly developed kernels to, uh, to test dynamic load balancing capabilities of, uh, well, runtime to say they'll do this for us automatically, or if it's not automatic, how difficult is it to do it? And then compare those also against application frameworks that have some capability of doing this, uh, this type of uh, um, um, operation. We've uh, already described a particle and cell kernel last year at IPDPS, which was marked, so it requires dynamic load balancing for efficiency, and it's marked by continually evolving mismatch. Uh, that's one uh, common source of, uh, of load imbalance, mismatch between dependent data structures. So one char has one part of the data structure, and uh, then it, uh, it, it needs another part from another data structure, and these chunks vary over time. That's, uh, that's very common in scientific applications. Um, in this case, it was continually evolving mismatch, and the total amount of work was fixed. So we, 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 we wrote a paper on it and was presented. But then we realized, well, OK, um, there are other types of uh, phenomena in our workloads uh, and in our systems that have another signature uh, requiring dynamic load, imbalance, uh, dynamic load balancing. And those are when you have abrupt, so not, not continually evolving, but abrupt changes in the, in the computational load uh, on part of the system, not all of it. Um, so in, in, in this case, in the uh, development of the adaptive mesh refinement kernel, the amount of work that you have will suddenly increase locally and then suddenly decrease again. So there's a step function. And you could interpret that as a proxy for a system disturbance where, for example, you change the frequency uh, on a certain core or maybe even on a whole node. Now, why would you want to do that? It may be necessary because you may be at the, at the edge of the, your power envelope, and if you let this node run wild at max frequency, it may throw the circuit breakers, and that's what you definitely want to avoid. So there may be uh, the runtime totally oblivious of your workload may say, I need to cut the frequency on this, uh, on this node and do so, and you need to suffer the consequences. So what do you do? Okay, so, let's, so uh, adaptive mesh refinement is a good proxy for this kind of, uh, uh, of phenomenon. And I'll try to describe it to you, and then, of course, I'll take questions when I'm done. So we start with a simple two-dimensional grid. I've just shown a very small one here. We call that the background grid. And uh, we apply a, an explicit stencil operation to it. I just gave an example here of a stencil with radius 2. You see this on the right-hand side. But you can vary that size. And what you can, uh, you can also uh, change, of course, is the size of the, uh, this background grid. Plus, let me see, I'll show you the first. See. OK. Uh, and at some point, a refinement will, will appear on this grid. Um, in, in the case of this kernel, we don't allow this to just wander all over the place, we, as it would in a real application. Uh, then we would not be able to keep track of it well, and we wouldn't be able to uh, compute an analytical solution, which you need for our verification test. So, uh, OK, so at some point, a refinement kicks in. In a real application, you would place this refinement in an area where you think the error is large, so you need to reduce that error. In this case, you simply prescribe that that refinement shows up somewhere. Uh, you, can cho you can choose how much of the background grid this refinement covers, and also what is the level of refinement within that grid. You can choose. Um, uh, the time period within which, and now let me show, do another example, uh, uh, within which um, uh, 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 the next refinement occurs and how long a refinement stays in existence. Um, and lastly, you can, you can choose how many times you want to apply the same explicit central operation on the, on the refinement per time step on the background grid. So if you have a number of knobs here that you can choose from uh, to, uh, so it, uh, to change the severity, 
uh, in terms of locality and temporal uh, uh, um, and frequency of disturbances on your uh, on your grid. I, I seem to have sent you the wrong version, uh, uh, Randall. I hope this is still the builds are visible on the screen. Um, I thought I had static uh, slides. Okay, so um, so you you have a background grid, and from time to time, these uh, one refinement uh, kicks in. Um, how do we implement this uh, uh, so that users who are interested in exploring the properties of this kernel on the system with the parameters of, the, of, their, uh, of their choice so that they can start playing with it? Well, we have two reference implementations. The first is in, in plain MPI, and I put then, uh, dynamic load balancing in quotes here. There's not much dynamic uh, in, uh, in there. It's a, uh, as will be clear in a moment, to, to make it dynamic would probably require quite a bit of work, um, and that's for future, uh, for future work. So first of all, we don't apply any over-decomposition as you would with uh, any of the, uh, of the advanced runtimes like Charm++ or Legion or others. So no over-decomposition. You, you divide the background grid and uh, uh, these refinements into uh, fixed uh, size chunks, and then you assign those chunks to ranks in the following order. So we have three different policies for, uh, for doing the work assignment in this kernel, uh, which correspond to common policies, believe it or not, in actual applications that use adaptive uh, mesh refinement. The first one is fine grain. This says, well, whenever we have, uh, uh, so we have a background grid already that abbreviated in BG, once a refinement shows up, we simply divide the work for that refinement among all the existing ranks. So it's called fine grain because before you know it, if you have only a small refinement, small in terms of number of points, and you divide it among all the existing ranks, that gets very fine grain, and that would be perfect load balance, but uh, you may well succumb to a latency cost. Here the other is high water. What you do there is you look at the union of the background grid and one refinement grid, and you divide it evenly among all the ranks in as large uh, chunks as possible. So some ranks will have a, a chunk for, of the background grid, and some ranks will have a chunk of the refinement. Once the refinement disappears, the ranks that had a refinement chunk have nothing to do. So we, we know up front that this is not load balanced, but in some, in some situations, this is, this is the most efficient thing to do. The last one is what I call no talk. There you divide the background grid among all the ranks, and then once a refinement grid shows up, you look at what ranks own the corresponding parts of the background grid, and that chunk of the refinement is assigned to the same rank of the corresponding part of that background grid. So in that case, there's no, um, no communication needed for the rank that works on the background grid to donate uh, data to initialize the refinement grid. That's a, a step that you always need to do in adaptive mesh refinement. So these are the three uh, MPI uh, policies, if you will, to divide the work. And we picked the last one for reasons that hopefully will become clear in one or two slides. For the uh, runtime orchestrated and dynamic load balancing, that's a catch-all for any of the advanced runtimes that, that promise to do automatic dynamic load balancing for us. And we picked adaptive MPI um, because it's so convenient that you just take your plain MPI code, uh, add, add some of the, um, uh, the, the operations to move data uh, as need be when you migrate ranks, and that's pretty much it. So it's a, it's a pretty simple procedure. The first time, of course, when you do it, you get it all wrong, but it becomes pretty, a pretty plain uh, uh, boilerplate, uh, fortunately after a while. So we didn't have to do too much work on the MPI uh, versions. We simply took the same type of partitioning as I described for, for, the, for the, the static MPI, if you will, combined it with over decomposition and had our adaptive MPI code. All right, then we did some experiments. Um, I did it on a shared memory workstation at Intel. Um, it has uh, 36 cores. Um, and we used all of them. So on, on, on uh, both systems that we used, we always had full occupation of whole nodes, because that's what you would do if you pay for the time to be on those nodes. So shared memory is 36, no, 36 cores, 
for this distributed memory experiments, we used the uh, the uh, the Cray XC30 at NERSC called Edison. Uh, some of you in the audience will probably have accounts on that machine, so you'll know it. It has somewhat smaller nodes, so 24 cores, and again, we uh, we fill them all up. For the shared memory experiments, we, like, like as I said, we used the NoTalk uh, work division, uh, a background grid of roughly 36k uh, uh, square points, and the refinements are 1500 uh, square points uh, with two levels of, of refinement, so altogether about 6k by 6k points. So let, let me let me tell you what that what that means. If you look at the relationship of the refinement grid and the background grid. The background grid is cut into 36 chunks because we have 36 cores. So each chunk is about six of the, uh, each background grid chunk is about 6k by 6k. That's pretty much the same as the refinement. So there's the same amount of computational work uh, per tile of the background grid as there is in the entire refinement. Now the fact that we do 400 time steps to make sure that we have enough. Um, uh, 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 moments where we actually introduce a refinement grid and remove it again. We do only one iteration on a refinement grid per background grid. We, we will change it later on for some more experiments, but for now this is what it is. And then we choose different durations. That's a, that are, those are lifetimes during which refinement grids are in existence. So we vary that from ten, 10 iterations on the background grid to 40 iterations on the background grid. So as that increases, there's a longer time that you have this background grid that you have this refinement grid. Um, the period between the times that, refine, that, that a refinement grid appears and that the next appears is two times the lifetime of a refinement grid. So you have as much time that there is a refinement grid, time in terms of iterations, as you have iterations where there, uh, where there is no refinement grid. And that means that as you change the duration of the refinement grid, so their lifetimes, you change the frequency of uh, 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 the refinements, but not the total amount of time of the refinement relative to the overall number of iterations. So that's convenient. So we, we, we now have introduced a, um, a frequency switch. We chose the refinement grid sufficiently small that they coincide with a single patch uh, or chunk of the background grid, even if you take over decomposition into account. What does that mean? So we have ranks and we've assigned a chunk of the background grid to ranks then all of a sudden, when a refinement kicks in, exactly one rank becomes responsible for that refinement. Uh, so all of a sudden, that rank will experience an increase in the amount of work. All the other ranks don't have that. So, uh, so that is what that would be the source of the load imbalance. For the adaptive MPI uh, experiments, uh, there are some more parameters that we uh, that we need to introduce. So the level of over decomposition we played from. Uh, we use 2, 4, and 8. We use two different types of load balancing, the refined load balancer from the, the Charm++ load balancing uh, uh, palette, and the greedy one. Uh, we use the migration delay. What is that? Um, after the load changes, we start monitoring the load on the system, which uh, if it did a good job before, it was completely balanced, and now all of a sudden it is no longer balanced. So we, we vary the migration delay within which we monitor that load imbalance between one and five time steps uh, so that the runtime has time to gather information and then we do the uh, we invoke the migration. Uh, and we use ISO malloc to migrate ranks which affect it on a, on a shared memory node comes down to you don't have to slog all the data around. It's, it's, it's in, the, in the shared memory domain. All right, this is a picture of... Uh, of our experimental configuration. On the left, the background grid, and you see the chunks assigned to the various ranks. And uh, the rank, uh, rank number five, uh, in, the, in the lower right-hand corner, uh, is going to be where, where, where uh, refinement number three is going to pop up um, at some times. So I showed an exploded view. So you see that it's actually, even though it looks very small, it has the same number of points at the time of the background grid. Uh, the nice thing about this kernel is that you can actually compute what is going to be the load imbalance under certain policies. So uh, uh, to refresh your memory, there is actually a good definition of load imbalance. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's defined for work and idle time, if you will, 
uh, between synchronization points, global synchronization points, um, and it's one minus the average time taken by the various workers to execute the work between the synchronization point, divided by the time that the max, uh, the slowest worker takes uh, between those synchronization points. So ideally, uh, the average time equals the maximum time, and then the uh, the load imbalance is zero. But as the the, uh, the max time goes up, the load imbalance becomes worse. So lower is better for load imbalance. If you do over decomposition, and I use Z as the number of cores per uh, uh, ranks per core, but no rank migration, then then uh, the adaptive MPI implementation becomes effectively the same as the plain MPI implementation. The load imbalance is a constant one third. And you may think that's not so disastrous, but actually it's really bad. At the time when there is no refinement, we are completely load balanced, so everybody has the same amount of work to do. But during the time of uh, refinement, some uh, one rank has twice the amount of work to do as all the others, and that is what uh, causes this load imbalance factor of one-third. If you do allow ranks to migrate, then you can compute uh, with the optimum rank placement strategy, uh, or rank migration migration strategy rather, your load imbalance drops down to its uh, now a reciprocal function of the number of uh, of uh, ranks per core, and it, it drops down to uh, drops down to zero. You see it in the picture there in the formula it shows the same. So if if our runtime works perfectly with no overhead, this is what we see. Okay, now uh, in our shared memory system, um, I made the following observations and. I used, like I said, the two uh, load balancing strategies. Refine is, well, uh, sort of naively put, it looks locally how to up, how to balance the load, not not globally across the whole system. In the in the case of the uh, uh, single shared memory node, of course, we can do either, but this is often what you do on clusters. And we found that the plain MPI version that does no dynamic load balancing, so it just needs to accept. The load imbalance that we uh, that we throw at it, uh, the, the plain MPI version and the adaptive MPI version performed about the same for all the parameters that we tested for. So for the various degrees of over decomposition, for the various amounts of time we gave it to uh, uh, gather information about uh, the, the load imbalance on the system. So we, I, I wrote down what the uh, the observed gigaflops, uh, and then there was some variation. On the uh, on the results, and I also noticed that about five percent of the uh, of the ranks migrate at uh, at every step uh, when we change the load and tell the runtime go do your best thing. When we switch to the greedy algorithm, the performance dropped, and uh, uh, the variations between the uh, the different runs uh, became bigger, and almost all the ranks migrated, even though you can show that if you simply move all the tiles, uh, so there, there's one rank that becomes busy when the refinement kicks in. That that rank owns a tile of the background grid and, and the refinement grid. In fact, with over decomposition, it will contain multiple tiles of the background grid and one tile that has a and one rank that has a tile of the background grid and the refinement. If you move off all the rank off the core, all the ranks that only have a uh, chunk of the background grid, that's the best you can do. And it's a small number. That is uh, uh, 1 minus the over, uh, sorry, the over decomposition factor minus 1. So there's uh, only 7 ranks would need to be moved, ideally, in the case of an over decomposition of 8. So we, we saw uh, in, the, in the case of Greedy, all ranks effectively moved around. Um, and uh, that, that gave rise to the lower performance. So I already said that the adaptive MPI performance was independent oh, also of the noise frequency, I should say. So sometimes uh, so I, I changed the frequency within, with which I uh, introduced the refinements from uh, 20 to 40 to 80 background grid iterations and the performance uh, uh, remained the same. You would expect that to actually get worse as the frequency goes up, but that was not the case. Um, then I found that uh, I, I, because we have these uh, kernels and we have the AMR kernel, if you take away the refinements, you end up with the plain stencil kernel, which you have had for a long time. And I thought, you know what, let me verify that the load imbalance that I computed uh, actually uh, materializes. So I took 
uh, a, a refinement grid the, 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 uh, the, and, and made that the whole grid for the, uh, for the stencil research kernel and compared the performance of computations, uh, computing on that refinement grid with just one rank to uh, a much larger grid, the same size as the background grid, but uh, now solving it on 36 ranks. So it's a stencil kernel, no refinements, but you can, ch you can compare performance of refinement and background grid in isolation with that kernel. And then I found that actually the, uh, w the time spent uh, operating on the refinement grid, which is not cut into chunks, so it doesn't have to communicate, was only about a fourth of that of the, of the chunk of the background grid. So, okay, I thought, oh, that's not so good. So I, was, uh, I didn't give really big jolts to the load, uh, load imbalance uh, for the rank, uh, or the, rather the core that receives the, uh, the refinement grid. So, you know, I, so I thought, let's, uh, 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 let's, make it, let's make the load imbalance more severe. So let's increase the work on the refinement grid by 4x and 16x respectively while keeping the work on the background grid unchanged and rerun my uh, experiments. And, uh, but again, we noticed that, uh, I noticed that the, the um, performance of the adaptive MPI compared to that of the plain MPI was about the same. Um, the only time when things actually changed noticeably was when I reduced the work on both the refinement grid and the background grid. I did it by 16x, I just picked a simple number. Um, now I found that for the longer durations of the refinement grid, so the lowest frequency of introduction of refinement grids, uh, uh, adaptive MPI and plain MPI were, were still about the same, but when I went even further down, so uh, the shortest duration of only 10 iterations that a uh, refinement grid is in existence, the performance uh, with, the, with adaptive MPI went down by 24%. So now we've made things really extreme. We gave it a very small problem to solve and, uh, and jiggled the box really often, changing the load very often. And then, of course, as you would expect, we saw, we saw a drop in performance because of that uh, high-frequency noise. Uh, I should say that, that uh, MPI doesn't suffer that because you don't change anything dynamically. It never needs to gather information about how the load is distributed among, uh, 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 across the system. It never migrates rank, so it has none of those overheads. So there's a headwind that you could say that, then that adaptive runtimes face, and they need to make up for it uh, by very smartly moving ranks around to even the load. And that's a very difficult task. So I'm not giving adaptive MTI anything simple to do here. I hope you, you recognize that. Okay, we also have results on a distributed memory system. Uh, there, the cycles are much more expensive because you need to sit in queues for a long time. So I, I made some judicious choices for the parameters. Greedy algorithm, you know, you can kind of predict that it's going to look even worse on a uh, cluster than on a single shared memory node. So I didn't test that. I only picked a refined load balancing policy. Uh, I did weak scaling. So as you increase the number of nodes by a factor of four, I let the background grid also go by a factor of four, which means 2x in each coordinate direction. But I kept the refinement grid constant. Uh, so that, that means that the, the rank that receives uh, the refinement grid once it kicks into existence, again, as in the shared memory case, simply doubles its uh, amount of work. I fixed the over decomposition at four. Maybe I should have picked a, a bigger number, but since I didn't see an influence on performance on the shared memory case. I just sort of the middle, the, something in the middle. And the migration delay, so the time that the runtime has to gather statistics about the load, I kept it, uh, I set it two iterations. Durations are again the same, 10, 20, and 40 iterations on the background grid are the lifetimes of the refinement grid. And I use pack and unpack, explicit pack and unpack for rank migration uh, as this, this is uh, uh, designed to be the fastest uh, communication mechanism on a distributed memory uh, system. So uh, I did this, uh, repeated the experiment that I did uh, on the shared memory system in a sense where I had one iteration on each refinement grid for each iteration on the background grid, and then got this result. It's a bit of a busy plot. Um, so on the horizontal axis, the number of nodes. So I, I just increased it by uh, my whole nodes at a time. Uh, the system scale, um, 
and the solid line, so performance is on the, uh, normalized to performance of a, uh, adaptive MPI on a single node. Um, so, uh, so the solid lines are the performance of the MPI implementation. So you might say the dumb MPI implementation that doesn't try to do anything smart. It should theoretically be a flat line, meaning as you add nodes, so you do weak scaling, you also increase the work uh, correspondingly. You, you would expect the same normalized performance. It goes, it varies a little bit as you move to the right. And I should say there's significant noise on these uh, computations. I try to get rid of most of it uh, by running multiple times, but there's only so much you can do. And then the adaptive MPI uh, results are in uh, uh, with the dash lines. Uh, the picture kind of follows what you what you would naively expect, namely that if you, the highest frequency of, of uh, noise, that is the duration equals 10, the blue line, gives you the lowest performance. And as you increase the duration, so the lifetime of um, the refinements, you get better performance. OK, so this was for the situation where I had just one uh, ref, uh, iteration on the refinement grid for an, iter for an iteration on the background grid which, as I mentioned a few slides back, actually kind of underestimates the load, uh, the load uh, source of load imbalance that I, that I had intended. I had intended to double the amount of work, and I do that, but I don't double the amount of load uh, because the refinement grid is treated much faster than the background grid. So the next, in the next experiment, I actually did four sub-iterations. So for each iteration on the background grid, I do four iterations on the uh, refinement grid. Um, and the scale of the plots is the same. So let me see. So the, you see the maximum here is 1.2 uh, normalized performance, and it's still 1.2 here. So you can interpret these plots in the same way. Everybody's performance drops. So in the, we, now we made the, the source of the load imbalance uh, more intense. And certainly, and the plain MPI implementation, which doesn't do anything special, its performance drops. Why it actually goes up substantially, as I, as I add nodes, it's repeatable. It's really there. I don't have an explanation for it yet, and, and that's, we need to find out why you actually do better as you add nodes. And not only that, you, the plain MPI version does better for the shortest period of the uh, shortest lifetime of existence of the refinement grid, which is kind of peculiar. You'd expect it to do poorest. The adaptive MPI results are closer together uh, in this case. They don't, uh, they're not as much affected as uh, the, the, the plain MPI version by the growth of the uh, system size, by the growth of the number of resources. Uh, but again, um, it, it's, it, it's given too tough a job and can't quite keep up with the, the MPI version that doesn't have any, uh, any runtime overhead, obviously. OK, so what do I conclude from this? And I should say it's, not, it's, it's a work in progress, because for example, we need to find out why the MPI version does better for shorter uh, times of disturbance than for longer ones. But uh, um, I, I think that the AMR kernel, uh, given the knobs that you have for changing the, uh, its behavior, is a good proxy, pretty flexible, to mimic local disturbances of your, uh, of your load in a very uh, well-controlled way. I found Adaptive MPI an extremely convenient vehicle for I would not be able to program this kernel, which is the most involved of all the kernels that we have in our suite. I wouldn't be able to, uh, to implement it so quickly in another runtime. So uh, it's a, a great convenience. Uh, but unfortunately, the task is so hard that you get these jolts where so all of a sudden the load increases and all of a sudden it decreases, and you need to deal with it right on the, at that moment that uh, so far, Adaptive MPI hasn't been able to do better than MPI. Um, in the future, what I'd like to do, so since I observed that the number of ranks moved at a change, uh, change of load point varies pretty wildly, easily 50% from, from one uh, load balance point to another, even though it's a very regular uh, pattern of uh, load jolt, if you will. Um, what I want to do is create an Oracle load balancer. I'll need to find out how to write my own load balancer in Charm++, which does exactly what, it's, what, uh, what I know is best. 
And for the in the case of this uh, AMR kernel, uh, with the parameters that I shown that I've shown, best is as I said to remove to move all ranks that uh, have only a background grid chunk, move those to other cores. So I know what I need to do. I just need to let the runtime know, okay, for now, ignore your measurements, move the load as I say, and then see what happens. And that could be really interesting, because then the only disadvantage that an adaptive runtime would have is the, over, the communication overhead of moving uh, data along with the work. So we, we, get a, we will get a cleaner picture. And then if that is successful, we can find out how to, how to change heuristics to do, uh, to do a more successful migration of ranks. And uh, lastly, I want to test other uh, new novel runtimes that uh, claim uh, a seat at the exascale table. Uh, I want to test them to see how well they can do with, uh, uh, with this kernel legion and HPX, you've probably all heard about OCR, is a more local affair uh, 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 run by uh, Intel and Rice, and see how they uh, can deal with the load variations of the adaptive uh, mesh refinement kernel. Okay, let's thank uh, our speaker. Take questions. <laughs> questions. Does anyone have any questions on this? All right, I've, I've got a quick one, real quick. Um, so, Rob, you mentioned that you used both the refine and greedy load balancers. Is there any reason you didn't try anything else, like refine swap or anything? Actually, I, I did those too, uh, but not uh, not for all uh, configurations. Uh, pretty quickly, did I find that uh, there was there was no variation. I, I can I, I can dig out what all the variations were. So, on shared memory systems, uh, you know it better than I do. There are a lot more choices for the load balancers, so I I, I did them all, and I saw no well that's a fair bit of noise. So uh, I did multiple runs, and for uh, with uh, each run for a particular configuration of parameters, I um, I did four independent runs, and I picked the best the best performance. Um, I saw no difference between the various choices. So. Um, I, I didn't show it, but they, there are there are variations within the refined load balancer that I uh, that I use. I think I, there were even two that I tried within the greedy load balancer, and then they were they were uh, uh, again I didn't see a difference, a market difference, other than that the greedy one, as you would probably expect, always performed more poorly than the refined load balancer. So yeah, I have tried the other ones as well. Okay, I think we've got another question here. I think we are running out of time, but a very short uh, question. I, are, is this, first of all, is this available in the repository yet? Yes, it is. It has been there for a while, and I will send the uh, the URL okay. of the... Uh, okay, I, I, I think um, we should discuss later since we're out of time, but basically... Uh, over uh, short question: Degree of over decomposition. Did you try larger ones? I mean, two and four is pr probably not enough, I and mean, eight is the minimum. Uh, and then the second uh, question is: Model. Uh, do you know about? I mean, since uh, you're not giving, uh, there's not enough time to adjust to the imbalance before you start the next one. A what we call model-based or prediction-based uh, balancing might be, might be a better strategy here. Um, okay, well, bo both are very good. Um, so, no, I haven't tried larger degrees of over decomposition, but that's easy to do. So, um, why don't we we, we can di discuss it separately? What's a good What's a good choice? The model-based load balancer may be what I naively call the Oracle load balancer. So let's so and that that's something I want to do anyway. So why don't we have a discussion about what's the best way to balance this uh, to balance the load? For this particular kernel, I did try. As I said, I did try. Uh, actually, I, your team gave me some suggestions. Uh, different times within which we gather information about the the, the load after a change in uh, in load, and uh, didn't see didn't see a structural difference. Maybe five iterations is not enough. That was the maximum that I tried. I tried anything from one to five. All right. Well, thank you again, Rob. Let's let's have another round of applause for our speaker here. Thanks.
Uh, they Thank can you. talk to you more later. My pleasure. Thank you.